Well, welcome everybody. A uh, special treat for me. My name is Jim Swift, uh, formerly uh, on the porch, correspondent at KXA and Television News in Austin, Texas, and a uh, graduate of Southwestern University back in 1970. And it is my pleasure today to sit down and have a visit with the newest president of Southwestern University, Laura Scandera Trombley. I am pronouncing it correct, Perfect. I hope. Okay, good. Um, the idea is just to give alumni and parents and current students, former students, the opportunity to get to know the newest president. We should note the first female president in the history of the university, which is a long history. And we'll get into that in a minute. But first, let me thank you for sitting down for this and, and welcome you to this chat. My pleasure. It's great to be here, and I'm glad that the weather is perfect for us today. Isn't it? <laughs> it, it snuck in. We, we weren't expecting this necessarily. Well, as, as I, I pointed out, you're the 16th mm -hmm. president of the university. That means they went through 15 of them without <laughs> bothering to get around to a woman. Now, there's reasons for that, I guess, probably none of them good. But I would like to start off by getting your reflections uh, on filling that role and, and making that mark in the history of this university? Well, I think it's symbolic. Uh, in addition to being the first woman president, I think I'm the first mother mm. who's also president. And that is something that I know is symbolic for a lot of people. It's really meaningful. But in many ways, I feel as though I'm following in my mother's footsteps because she was one of the first elementary school principals in Los Angeles. So I grew up seeing a mother who was an administrator and who really enjoyed it. And she was a great role model for me. And I hope that at, in the not too distant future, having a woman president is not seen as new or exceptional or unusual. Yeah, and your, your dad was also involved in education. He was, he was an elementary school uh, teacher for many, many years. What grade? Uh, his favorite grade was fourth grade. Okay, so he bounced around. <laughs> did, did you have an opportunity to attend a school that your mother was principal at? Or <laughs> Happily, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't taught by either one of my parents. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that was a good thing. Yeah, for a me. lot of people know, I think uh, some people know, that my father was uh, at one point vice president for student affairs here, but mostly oh. he was dean of students at Southwestern for many, many years. Oh, my. Including the time that I was here. Okay. And his portfolio included uh, f the fraternities uh, as well as the residence halls. And so I know what that's like. That's a lot. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, a big lot. portfolio. So I'm happy for you because uh, <laughs> there, there are stressors with that. Oh, on, on the other hand, it was great, too. Yeah. You know, it, it, was, it, it provided uh, a unique perspective, as mm -hmm. I'm sure you took away from your parents' involvement. Did they encourage you down this line uh, of endeavor? or? I think they were great role models for me. Mm -hmm. And I grew up knowing, I think, pretty keenly the rewards of being a teacher as well as the amount of time that it takes in order to truly be a wonderful teacher and that this was really uh, a commitment that you had to make to students and so they were wonderful role models teaching was something that maybe i didn't really realize it at the time but i went into the family business yeah. and uh, and then as i went forward with my career becoming uh, an administrator was something that wasn't completely foreign to me, even though in higher education, women are underrepresented in administrative roles. Yeah, we're gonna to get to that. But parenthetically, going from the teaching end of it to the administering end of it, what, what drew you in that direction? Well, I had been teaching for a number of years. I taught at Pepperdine University, where I graduated from USC, which I also graduated from. And then I taught in Europe for a few years. And then I was teaching at SUNY Potsdam, State University of New York. And so I had taught for probably a good dozen years. And I wound up getting asked to chair different committees on campus. And I enjoyed the committee work. And I always promised everyone that if we didn't have an agenda, then we weren't going to meet. But when we met, we were going to try and be as effective as possible because people's time is really important. 
And uh, I think I did a pretty good job of it. And eventually the president of the university invited me to become part of his administrative cabinet. And I thought, well, this is interesting in a way to maybe make a uh, change for perhaps a larger audience than just my students. And so I thought I'd give it a try. And here you are. <laughs> and here I am, here right are. around the corner. On your umpteenth presidency. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's get back to this business of not only women, but people of color uh -huh. and their involvement. And you, you've talked about both of these mm -hmm. aspects of, of university life. We could sit here forever talking about the why of all of that. Sure. Um, I'm more interested in where we go from here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in picking your brain a little bit, locally, Southwestern, mm -hmm. but university life in general. Right. What, what is it going to take and why is it important that we involve more women and more people of color at the university level? I've had this conversation with students and uh, faculty, alumni, many times over the years. And I always start by making it clear when I was a student, and I was a student for a long time, 13 years straight through, um, I never had a full professor who was female. Mm. I never had uh, a person of color except for one occasion when I was in graduate school. I never saw a woman administrator. And so there really wasn't any real sense that this was a place where women belonged. And particularly when I became a mother and I wanted to be an extremely involved mother, I'd waited a long time. I was 35 when my son was born. Uh, I then became aware that this was not a space that was really accommodating for mothers and for working parents and personal experience as well as listening to students and i think just trying to be part of the greater good means that you create opportunities both of my parents were first generation college educated education gave them huge opportunities that otherwise certainly for my father who was an orphan in the great depression he never would have had without a college education and so that means to me that we have to have access, we have to encourage representation. I don't want students to go through what I did, never seeing anybody like me, either as a professor or as an administrator. I think it's important to see representation and it's the right thing to do. Well, and, and, and most of that answer has, seems to me, has to do with creating opportunities for individuals like yourself. And, and you touched on the other aspect of it too, which is the opportunities that it gives to students and other members of the community to have that kind of perspective, a female perspective, mm -hmm. uh, on the various issues that arise in university mm -hmm. life. Um, talk to me about that. What, what, as a woman, what do you bring? What do I bring? Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly can multitask like crazy. <laughs> I'm a really, ex really quite an expert as far as that's concerned. Yeah, but a man would have to be able to do that too. Uh, I think everyone should be able to do that. Yeah. I also think that uh, I'm aware that I have to demonstrate that I can lead, that people don't instantly think that necessarily that um, since I am not what many people would picture as a president, uh, then I need to demonstrate that indeed I can do the job that I not only um, am equal to, but I would say probably very successful in that degree. And it's not enough simply to say you want greater representation. What you have to do is you have to demonstrate it. You have to hire you have to create programs, you have to support, and you have to understand that life is different for all of us. And particularly as a working mother, where I think my responsibilities in the home were considerably more than male presidents who had children my son's age. Yeah. Um, that was something that I had to really work into my administrative life and make it very clear in a way that perhaps others didn't that I was going to be 
a very active parent, very involved with not just the college, but also with my son's education and upbringing. And I had a very full portfolio. And if the institution was interested in having someone who had a life like that, then I think it would be a perfect fit. But if they were expecting perhaps uh, a president who was not going to have that much of an involvement in terms of her personal responsibilities, then they probably needed to find someone else. But I, I have always tried to be very honest about who I am, what I am, how I value uh, my life as it is, both personally and professionally. So it isn't about wanting, it's about doing ah. and creating pathways for other people to follow you. And so wherever I have been, as an administrator, I've always created those pathways. Yeah, uh, tomorrow I'm gonna sit down with Dr. Moore and, and you know, she, as an educator of educators is one who the ripple effect of her daily mm -hmm. life spreads out um, into the community for generations. Yes. Yours will also. Mm -hmm based on the hires that you make, the policies that you put in place, mm -hmm. the things you emphasize. Mm -hmm. um, you're aware of the long-term impact, if you do it right, I guess. <laughs> of, uh, of the opportunity. Or if I don't, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's also a long-term impact. Yeah, either way. <laughs> uh, are, are you aware of that on a in a heightened way or you know you, you you talk about multitasking and how busy you are do you have time to stop and think about the impact that you're going to make I, I often don't have a lot of time to think about those kinds of things but i am aware that everything that we do matters it matters and there's a purpose to it mm. and there's an outcome whether it is one that you have anticipated or not and when I, again, speak with students, I talk to them about the changes that I have seen in my life. And I point out to them that, well, you might think that it's normal seeing a woman president. It's something that I couldn't imagine as an undergraduate, where you might think we do not have enough representation on campus in terms of a diverse faculty or staff. Um, I can guarantee you it is far more than anything that I ever experienced. So change takes time. It mm. takes time and it has to be, I think, respected and managed. But also we have to be aware that we have progressed. Everyone is impatient to get to the next stage and I am as well. But I've already seen just in the course of my career such a huge change. So on the subject of, of nurturing mm -hmm. change um, in terms of gender and, and uh, ethnic and, and uh, racial representation in the mm -hmm. university community, uh, I was told when I sat down here today that you told people that you want them to call you Laura. <laughs> And, um, you know, when I first got down here, the president of Southwestern University was Dr. Durwood Fleming. Yes. In my wildest dreams, I cannot imagine anyone saying, hey, Durwood, you know, uh, it, it's yeah. just not, it would not have been done. I don't have too many people saying, hey, Laura. But you don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. But the fact that they told me that, that it's okay to yes. tell you that. Well, it, it, that's saying something, isn't it? In, in terms of accessibility I think to the it's, community? Yes. When I was an undergraduate student, I could not have imagined anything other than President Banowski and, and President White. And I think that there are occasions when indeed that is absolutely appropriate when yeah. it's a formal occasion. But when I'm walking at 730 in the morning on Fridays with students, um, I think <laughs> to have them only refer to me as president uh, it's a little bit more of an informal moment. Yeah. And I would really like for them to understand that I'm here as their advocate, I'm here as their supporter, I'm not here as their judge. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really want to be the scholar teacher uh, because that's what I've always aspired to be. At the same time, 
Uh, I understand the importance of titles, and I do think that one should respect the president as you respect everyone. Mm -hmm. And there are times when being the president in terms of that title is very ceremonial, and it is absolutely appropriate at those times. Yes. Uh, and depending on what's being dealt with at the time, too. Very I mean, much so. Yeah. And again, it's all about the place and what is happening and what is appropriate at that time. Mm -hmm. But when I'm speaking to alumni or to parents, uh, I really like to have more of a casual conversation with them if that's appropriate. Because what are you trying to, to do there? Well, I think in many ways, uh, particularly if you happen to be a first generation student or your family is not one that feels necessarily as though they are part of the community, part of my role is to make everyone feel like they're part of the community. And I remember even though my parents uh, went and had their bachelor's and their master's degrees and were educators, when I went to college, everything was intimidating to me. Everything was terrifying to me. Yeah. You know, uh, my greatest fear, I think my first two weeks was trying to remember where my residence hall was. Yeah. <laughs> and, and anything that we can do to make people feel as though they are part of something, that they belong to some place, and that they also are being greeted with not just friendliness, but empathy, and that it's okay to ask questions. I think that's also really part of our mission. It's hard enough to learn in a situation like that um, it, when you're first arriving on a campus. Mm -hmm. I mean, goodness gracious, it seems to me it's hard enough for you to go from one <laughs> university setting or to the Huntington, for example. Um, hopefully we'll get a chance to, to sketch over your background. But to go from one institution to another institution to another to another, um, man, you know, I was at Channel 36 for 36 years. I didn't have to do that. Right. Now, I did have to deal with a new boss every two or three years. <laughs> but but I, the environment was the same. Mm -hmm. What is it like for you to, I mean, you know, this was, and to some degree, I suppose, still is uh, affiliated with the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. But pastors, ministers in that church move, most of them, routinely until they, get to the mega churches every three years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, not only they, but the congregation has to get new, used to a whole new thing. True. You know, what's it like for you to find yourself? You've only been here since July. Since July and coming in the middle of a pandemic yeah. kind of made everything particularly uh, unusual and interesting and challenging. It was never really my intention uh, starting that I would go to different institutions. That wasn't part of any kind of game plan, so to speak, or business plan. However, when I was uh, graduating from the University of Southern California, at that time, they offered me a position, as did Pepperdine, it was great. But I thought, I don't wanna spend my whole life here. I want to go and experience something that's new, something that's different, something that will test me. And so at that time I was a Mark Twain scholar, so I had this sense that I should be close to Hartford. I'm not sure how well founded it was at the time, yeah. but it just seemed to make sense to me. And so I looked for the best tenure track position that was close to Connecticut. So that's how I wound up in New York. Yeah. And where I lived in New York, it was about 20 minutes from the Canadian border. I had never lived in a rural community before. The little town where I wound up buying a home had about 150 people living oh. in it. It was a village, truly. Yeah. And that's where I had my son. And it was a place where it would be 40 below zero for weeks in the wintertime. So I was there for seven years, <laughs> seven long, long years. And it was a great place if you were frankly interested in scholarship because the winters started in October and in some instances finished in May. And uh, so I did a lot of writing while I was there. But then I had a little baby and I thought, I want my child to grow up in more of a community setting. And so that's why I moved to Iowa. And Iowa is an extremely child-friendly state. 
And I had a wonderful time there. Uh, and I have many friends still in Iowa. And my son really had an idyllic childhood. But I had the only grandchild, and my parents lived in California. Mm -hmm. And my son and my father were incredibly close. My father was 78 when my son was born, and he thought he would never have a grandchild. And as someone who was an orphan, having a baby was really important to him, having that link. And so uh, I was approached by a college in California and recruited, and I thought, this is an interesting way to kind of make whole, that I come back, my son has his grandparents, and if I'm going to try and be a president, it's in a place that's familiar to me. And so in terms of the culture, that might make it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And so after having spent 13 years doing everything I could think of at this one particular place, I thought maybe it's time that I step outside of academia for a little while and I had always admired the Huntington, and as someone who had often been there doing archival research, I thought, well, this, again, is a place that's familiar. And I was there for two years, and then I just really missed students. And the Huntington is a very quiet research institution with beautiful gardens, but it's very, very quiet. And I wanted to teach again. I missed teaching. I missed being with students. And I also thought this is a good time maybe for me to start my sixth book. So I gave myself a sabbatical for a year, started a book, taught a little bit at USC. And then my son was finishing his college career at Union College in Schenectady. I was approached by a university in Connecticut to go and help them. They were having some budgetary problems and I thought, I'll be close to my son. I'll be an hour and a half away from Grand Central Station. Connecticut is a Mark Twain kind of place. Yeah. And so I was there. So it wasn't just about career advancement and hopscotch. There were always personal reasons yeah. for doing this. There, it was, um, for me, I had always wanted to have a child. It was incredibly important to me. And so a lot of what wound up in terms of my moves had to do with my son and also what felt right for me and what I was really in, intrigued with and felt I could add value. But the two were always intermingled. Yeah. You brought up Mark Twain and I'm, I'm so glad because uh, there's no way I'm getting out of this thing <laughs> <laughs> without exploring that. Um, you've done a lot of scholarship on Mark Twain and, and written, as you pointed out, a number of books uh, on, related to the, the gentleman. <clears throat> Tell me how you got there. You know, it's, a, it's a, uh, amazing, really. Uh, I certainly didn't go looking for Mark Twain. I think he found me. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I was a PhD student at USC, and I was planning to write my dissertation about uh, Wordsworth because that was mostly my background, uh, romantic poets, British romantic poets. But one day my professor called me and told me that he had been contacted by um, a private individual claiming he had a hundred letters that Twain had written. And he said, it can't be true. Nobody has a hundred Mark Twain letters, but why don't you go check it out? And I said, all right. So he had, uh, been a banker in Los Angeles, had retired to Sacramento. So I drove up to Sacramento and he showed me into uh, the family room and on top of this uh, card table were just stacks of letters. And uh, he said, well, there they are. And I started to look through them and they were still in their original envelopes and they had stamps and so forth. And I just had this feeling like this is um, bigger than I am. And uh, I said, how did you come across these? And he had decided to collect stamps in retirement. So he went to a downtown hobby shop in Los Angeles and asked if they had any junk for sale. And they said, well, we just cleared out a house and we'll sell the letters to you for a hundred bucks. And so he bought them. And at first he was going to throw them away because the stamps weren't worth anything. But his wife started to read through the letters and she said, I have no idea who this guy is, but he's a great writer and he's really funny and so interesting. And they had the letters for months before they realized S.L. Clemens 
is Mark Twain. Uh -huh. But even then, he didn't really think that they were very valuable. And just for fun, he used to carry one with him. And so he was on the bus one day, and there was a young woman sitting there, and he said, here, I'll show you a Mark Twain letter. And she said, how did you get that? And he told her the story. And she said, you should contact my professor at USC, who is my professor. Uh -huh. And so what happened in the end was most of these letters were written to his three daughters. And they were about business decisions, about investments, ideas for stories. And I read through all of them. And I didn't know he was married. I didn't know he had a family. I didn't know any of this. But I marveled at the amount of correspondence and the level of dialogue that they were having. And I thought, well, this would make an interesting dissertation. It seems a lot more fun yeah. than writing about the Neoplatonic <laughs> progression in Wordsworth's prelude. So I went the Mark Twain route. And the lucky um, retiree, he wound up selling them for just under half a million dollars through auction. All 100 of them? or uh, All of them. He sold all of them. But there were so many, they had to sell them in two lots. Uh -huh. Otherwise, they would drive down the... I guess the worldwide value of Mark yeah. Twain of supply ephemera. and demand. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well, now you also wrote a book, if I understand this correctly, about a woman that was associated <laughs> with Mark Twain. Yes. Uh, you, you know who I'm talking about. Tell me about that. Well, I think a lot of my work, if I tried to sum it up, is I have spent the last 30 years or so of my life um, talking about Mark Twain's secrets that he didn't want anybody to know. And in my first book that I wrote, I talked about how heavily he relied upon women for his political views, his social views, his progressive views, and how they ultimately influenced uh, the writing of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which at the time was a very radical idea that women could actually have some kind of influence on a man and their family. I don't think that's quite so revolutionary anymore, but at the time it was. And in the course of that work, I discovered that he had a long-term personal assistant uh, who was with him for nearly seven years, but very, very little had ever been written about her. Yet the Mark Twain Project that's located um, in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley, they had all of her journals and day books, and she kept a daily record of her time with him, uh, what he ate, what he drank, who he saw, what he was working on. And it was just amazing. It was an invaluable resource. and Like a fly on the wall. Absolutely. Yeah. And I became very curious about why she was just why she had been vanished, so to speak. And I did a lot of research. And as it turned out, her relationship with Twain grew. His daughters became very jealous of her. And in the end, they demanded that uh, her father, that their father banish her from his life. And uh, I think it actually hastened his death. And he was very bitter and angry about it. And his last extended piece of writing is all about her, uh, which had never been published. And it's very, very angry and bitter. And it was almost as though Twain scholars, since they didn't know what to do with it, they kind of just tucked it away. And so the book is about their relationship, about the cover story, and frankly, the threatening manuscript that Twain wrote and why she was important to him. So it's really about their relationship, and it was a relationship he never wanted anyone to find out about. <laughs> he basically decreed, yeah. don't, don't talk about her. That's right. But he talked about her, as you pointed out. He, he did. He had some he, choice words. Yeah, he really did, and it was kind of a blackmail document, and he threatened her that if you ever say that we had any connection whatsoever, this will be published and you will be destroyed. It's a, it's a really fascinating story, and it brings out a lot of dimensions about Twain that obviously he would not necessarily have wanted people to know because he had a very carefully crafted public image. But the most fascinating part of all of that, it took me a very long time to write because I had to uncover all of this information, but the woman's family members um, 
I went and visited them in Connecticut and her great nephew uh, was a little boy when she was still alive. And you would have thought that this happened last week. They were still so angry at Mark Twain. <laughs> they had never <laughs> forgotten, never <laughs> forgiven. And uh, they were very suspicious of me. And they thought, well, what are you going to do to her? Uh, and I said, you know, I know more about this woman than I know about my mother at this point in terms of her early life. I've done so much research. And so I told them about her and gained their trust. And after the book came out, they came to one of my um, readings that I gave at the Hartford home. And afterwards, uh, one of them wrote to me and said, you know, I think she's smiling from heaven because you brought her back to life and yeah. you gave her a life. Yeah. And that was very touching for me because when you think of Mark Twain, I think often people assume that's such a long time ago that you don't think that there's anyone that still really remembers him or members of his family. So some would say, if you're writing that kind of biography, it's easier than working on someone who's still alive because people are very protective of themselves. However, every time I've written anything about Twain, I always, people always find me. And uh, after this last book, I had his um, granddaughter's best friend contact me and say, you know, do you know much about his granddaughter? He, and he only had one granddaughter, one grandchild. And I said, no. And she said, oh, let me tell you all about it. And I said, I said, I can't help, but how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and she was 88 years old. Uh... And his granddaughter passed away in the early 60s. And she said, you know, I have this whole box of stuff in my garage. I have photographs and I have letters. Would you be interested in them? I said, well, that's kind of my bread and butter. You know, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what yeah. I deal with. So no one is ever really gone. There are always people who have stories or they have something to remember them by. Um, Twain's secretary, her family, after I got done talking to them about her, they said the same thing. Well, we have a box. Would you want to see it? And the most fascinating piece in that box was Twain had given her a pipe and they used to sit together and smoke at a time when if a woman smoked in public, she would be arrested. Yeah. So it was a very, very kind of roguish thing to do. And they said, well, here's the pipe he gave her. And I said, oh, my gosh, that makes it so real to me. Yeah. You know, you could still smell the tobacco on it. Oh, man. <laughs> so you got a hold of a thread and started pulling on it. And, and then the thing... this whole story came out, which yeah. I, in a, you know, again, lives are complicated. And when you have someone like Twain, who was obsessed with his legacy, and by the end of his life, he was widely recognized as America's greatest writer, but he wanted to be known as the greatest writer ever. And so anything that he thought might diminish the possibility of that being his legacy, he was going to get rid of to the best of his ability. And he was very focused about it in, in ways that both uh, frighten me and I admire because he was so single minded in purpose. And I think his construction is still very much true today. When I talk to high school students and I ask them to imagine what does Mark Twain look like, every time some students will say, isn't he kind of an old guy with white hair and in a white suit, kind of like Colonel Sanders or something? And I said, that's exactly the image he wants you to have of him. Uh, exactly. And uh, he's been gone since 1910. So why do you think of that? Because if I asked you, what does Walt Whitman look like? I'm going to guess that nobody here has a really clear image of that. But what he created then, he was a master when it came to branding himself. That's the image we still have. Which provides perfect opportunity to segue into the branding, not just of Southwestern, but of higher education in general at a time when costs to attend mm -hmm. universities are skyrocketing, when student debt is just massive in this country. Um, 
there are politics in every human <laughs> endeavor. <laughs> True. <laughs> but definitely in the university, uh, in academia. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you are entrusted, it seems to me, among everything else that, that is expected of you with the responsibility of ensuring the reputation uh, and the financial stability mm -hmm. of Southwestern University. Mm -hmm. It's a big load. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a big load. I mean, <laughs> uh, if, if I were you, I'd wake up thinking about it numerous <laughs> times in the night. Uh, you, you feel that? Do you feel it as a burden or do you feel it as an opportunity? How does it impact you? I think I feel it as a responsibility. Um, this is my 18th year being a president. So at a certain point, you either learn how to ride the wave or you do something else. I sleep like a baby. Uh, mm. That might be my great talent. <laughs> <laughs> so I can sleep really well at night. And we are in the midst of a number of different opposing forces. So we have more and more individuals coming into higher education. The demographic generally is falling. However, we certainly have more first generation and more students of color coming into higher education than ever before. All of the studies that have been done show economically, you will always earn more if you're a college graduate than if you are not a college graduate. We have also seen expenses exponentially increase at the same time, we have seen state and federal support decrease, which has given rise to fundraising because somehow we have to try and bridge that delta. And I did a, an interesting exercise a number of years ago because as you will imagine, I hear from parents and students every year, why does college cost so much? And quite simply, the reason for that is because we do so much. And not only do we do so much, but we also want to pay people wages that are equity wages and that are fair wages. And so what I did at that time was I created two categories. And the one was, here's what existed when I was a student, here's what exists now for students. And so on my column, when things were much less expensive, uh, I didn't have computers, they didn't exist. We didn't have a career center. We didn't have counseling. We didn't have medical center. We didn't have intramurals. We didn't have anything except meat that no one would even tell me where it had come from. <laughs> <laughs> we had bread, meat, and a really small salad bar. What we didn't have, we didn't have vegan. We barely had vegetarian if you liked eating a lot of salad. Um, and then I listed all of the things that we do now have for students, and particularly students who have um, learning issues where we need to help them and proctor exams, where we need to offer support, psychological services, medical services, the list goes on and on and on. And I asked parents, what do you want me to get rid of? Mm. Well, we don't want you to get rid of anything. We want you to make it cheaper. And I said, okay, well, here's how I can make it cheap, okay? Easy, done. I will teach a composition course for 300 students, you know, and all of our students will just take 300 student classes. So we'll teach biology 101, 300 students, composition 300 students. And the parents said, well, how much are they going to learn? I said, that's not what you asked me. Yeah. You asked me to make it cheap. Yeah. I said, if you want it to be high quality, then it's going to cost and it's going to cost more than it used to because of the wages that we paid back in the day and we also didn't have the things that we now see as acceptable a friend of mine years ago dick chade at harvard said institutions are now in the amenities arms race we have universities that have lazy rivers we have universities that have climbing walls every possible kind of amenity but that's also what now students are expecting. And so we have created some of that problem ourselves. But for institutions who refuse, students and parents look at that as a lack of value. Mm. So it's very, very difficult. I go through the budgets here in fine detail because I'm always doing two things simultaneously. 
trying to watch every penny we spend, trying to create greater value every year. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, when I first came to Southwestern my freshman year, I, it wasn't 300, but there was 100 students in my introductory chemistry class taught, I should point out, by a wealthy man who took a salary of one dollar a year? That's nice. That's, so, that's great. You know, yeah. Hire wealthy professors, and you'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, uh, I'm seeing arms wave out there, and it's unfortunate because there's a bunch of other stuff I'd love to get to with you. But it's been a pleasure, and congratulations Thank you. on your new job. And uh, there are challenges, planning-wise, COVID-wise, that we haven't <laughs> been able to get to. Um, maybe that's a sign of the times that COVID is finally beginning to recede and we don't have to talk yeah. about that so much. But the answers to questions about that, I'm sure you have and people that are interested can reach out to you. Absolutely. And, and, and get the, the answers that they need. Thank you so much. It's just Thank you. been a dadgum pleasure. It was a real pleasure. Okay.